Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce this evening's keynote speaker. They say that diplomacy is the velvet glove that cloaks the fist of power. Indeed, I think those familiar with the biography of our keynote speaker can agree that he has worn that velvet glove with mastery and finesse. Ambassador William Taylor was thrown into the public limelight after testifying at the 2019 impeachment hearings looking into President Donald Trump's attempt to leverage a foreign investigation of his political opponent in return for weapons for Ukraine. Days before his testimony, Ambassador Taylor published an editorial in which he wrote, and I quote, the United States is firmly committed to Ukraine's success. Your success is our success. We will not allow Russia to dismantle the international order that was painstakingly built after World War II. The concepts of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and peaceful resolution of disputes benefits all nations. And Russia's war against Ukraine shreds the international norms that kept peace and enabled prosperity for decades." Unquote. William Taylor was first appointed U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine by former President George W. Bush in 2006. Mr. Taylor served as the top U.S. diplomat in Ukraine from June 2006 to May 2009. In fact, it was while William Taylor headed the U.S. mission in Kiev that the U.S. Embassy requested that the government of Ukraine rename a cave street in honor of James Mace, the American historian, journalist, and Holodomor researcher. In September 2011, Ambassador Taylor was appointed Special Coordinator for the Middle East Transitions. From then through 2013, Ambassador Taylor's mission was to ensure effective U.S. support for the countries of the Arab Spring Revolutions, coordinating assistance to Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Syria. Prior to serving as Washington's top diplomat in Ukraine, Ambassador Taylor also served as the U.S. government's representative to the Mideast Quartet, which facilitated the Israeli disengagement from Gaza and parts of the West Bank. After the sudden departure of Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, William Taylor returned to Ukraine in June of 2019 as Chargé d'Affaires, taking over the U.S. mission in Kiev for a brief but eventful tenure. It should also be noted that earlier in his career, William Taylor served in Brussels as Deputy Defense Advisor at the U.S. Mission to NATO and was the coordinator of U.S. assistance to the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Ambassador Taylor is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he was the top, he was, I believe, in the top 1% of his class. He served for six years as an Army infantry officer, including with the 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam. He is one of America's most experienced diplomats, having served in every administration of both parties since 1985. This past October, Ambassador Taylor addressed the first parliamentary summit of the International Crimea Platform held in Zagreb, Croatia, and he was a high-profile participant at this year's Munich Security Conference. If you're not watching him, as a nonpartisan global affairs commentator on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, CBS, Frontline, and recently The National here in Canada on the CBC, then you're listening to one of the Apple podcasts. And you may even be reading one of his fabulous opinion pieces. In fact, Mr. Ambassador, we are grateful for your recent excellent opinion piece in The Atlantic. It was a slam dunk repudiation of those who claim cutting off aid to Ukraine will bring about peace. It's not an exaggeration to say that elected and former U.S. officials of both parties regard Ambassador Taylor to be one of America's most respected diplomats, describing him as a man of honor, high ethics, and a true American patriot. And we are truly privileged to have him here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Vice President of the U.S. Institute of Peace, a strategic thinker, and a diplomat for our times, Bill Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> By far, the longest introduction I have ever had. <clears throat> Uh, and, and I, I, but I, and I greatly appreciate it. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, I'm delighted to be able to talk with you, and I hope it is. It, I, it, I guarantee you, it will be a conversation because I'm going to ask for your ideas and thoughts and reactions um, to make this a con uh, conversation. <clears throat> I am here to talk about Ukraine. I am here to talk about uh, the future of Ukraine. Um, and when thinking about the future of any nation or any future, um, it's interesting that sometimes we can affect that future. Sometimes we can affect that future. And this is a time. Uh, this is a time when we can determine uh, to a large extent which way the future goes in Ukraine. Um, several of you uh, and I had conversations earlier today, um, and, and I described two futures, uh, two scenarios, um, two ways that, that, uh, that Ukraine could go, two ways this war could go um, over, the, over the next six months, over the next several years, and we can have an effect on this. Indeed, we're going to have an effect uh, on this. Um, Ukraine can win this war. Ukraine can win this war. Um, and if it's successful over the next couple of months, this summer, if Ukraine is successful in mounting a counteroffensive against the Russians uh, over the next several months, Ukraine can win. But what I said earlier is important. That is, we can affect that. We have provided, we, Canadians, Americans, NATO, the West. Um, we have provided Ukraine with a lot of assistance. Military assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, energy assistance. Um, we, have done, we have done well. We have done well. And Ukrainians, we've all talked to Ukrainians. The first thing, thank you. They, they appreciate what we've done. We need to do more. We need to enable them Ukrainians who are the ones fighting um, to defend themselves, but to defend us, we need to provide them with what they need to win this war. And they can, and we can. Um, it's important that we recognize that and that we in Canada, we in, in the United States, keep that support coming. Um, we, heard, we hear about fatigue whether it's war fatigue or whether it's uh, other kinds of fatigue, uh, assistance fatigue. No. Uh, the Ukrainians are tired. The Ukrainians are tired, but they're not stopping. They're fighting. They continue to fight. They've been fighting for 14 months. Everybody in this room probably has friends, family, um, some of whom have died, right? and some of whom are still there <clears throat> and are still fighting. And we need to support them as they, as they mount that counteroffensive. Now, they can do this. We can do this. Um, the two scenarios that, I, that, I, that, are, in, that are in my mind, uh, one is a short scenario. One is a six-month scenario. is a two-month scenario where uh, the Ukrainians mount this counteroffensive with many new brigades. Um, there are somewhere between 12 and 18 new brigades of Ukrainian uh, soldiers, tanks, artillery. Um, these, these, new, these new formations are, are being trained in Poland, um, in Germany, um, in, in Western Ukraine, and they're preparing. Uh, they're preparing as fast and as, as well as they can. Their generals, again, we now know we now know these generals, General Zaluzhny, General Sirsky. Um, they are thinking about where they're going to mount this counteroffensive. Uh, just, you know, we've got, we've got the map. Everybody knows the map. But um, um, what we don't know um, is where and exactly when these, this counteroffensive will, will, will be mounted, will take place. Um, and we shouldn't know. Uh, the, the Russians, we can't let the Russians know. This needs to be a surprise, and this will be effective if they have the ammunition, the, the tanks, uh, the equipment, 
um, that, that we can provide. And if we do, if we provide that, and if they are able to mount this offensive and break through somewhere along that line, they can break through and that will open up the line. And that will open up a, a, a corridor for the other units coming behind these forward units to break through and exploit that breakthrough. Um, and when that happens, th they can cause the Russian army, and the Russian army as we know is fragile at this point. Uh, the Russian army, they tried their offensive, the Russians have tried their offensive um, over the past seven or eight months. We know that they've been in Bakhmut, right in the middle of, the, uh, of, of Donbass, um, since last summer, and they've failed. They little by little, they're taking a little bit, they have failed. Uh, they have spent. So the Russians are temporarily in, in bad shape. I say temporarily because we all know 140 million Russians, um, they can, the, Putin can go uh, to those 140 and he can draft and he can impress and he can pull people into the army. It'll take time and to train them and to equip them and to get them. So right now, the Russian army is fragile. And right now is the time for the Ukrainians to break through, and they can do that. That's, that's my one main message. If they do that, they will be able to crack that. If the Ukrainians do that, they'll be able to destroy the cohesion uh, of, the, of the Russian army. And that then can push, that, that can allow the Ukrainians to win. And win. What is win? The Ukrainians have been very clear. We've all talked to them. The Ukrainians are very clear. They want the Russians. That's, that's a win. That's how they win. And, and I've just described how that can happen. If they get out of most of, if they are able to push the Russians out of most of that red area on the map, with the possible ex exception of Crimea, um, then there could be a conversation. President Zelensky and, 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 uh, Prime, and Foreign Minister Kuleba um, have said explicitly that they're going to take back every square meter um, of Ukraine. They're going to take back all of Ukraine. And they've said that a lot of that taking back is going to be military. And that's what we're seeing. And that's this counteroffensive that I'm talking about now that can be effective, can be effective at pushing the Russians back out of most of the country. But they've also said Kuleba and Zelensky have both said that some of that taking back could be through diplomacy. Could have a, they could have a conversation. If the Russians are pushed back, and so far, back out of the country, back into Russia, they may then sit down and have a conversation. And Zelensky and Kuleba have said, never going to give up claim to Crimea, but they're willing to talk about over what period of time, maybe five years, ten years, demilitarized Crimea during that time, at the end of which, in their view, and we should support this, Crimea will come back as well. But it doesn't all have to happen in the next two months. What has to happen in the next two months, in this short scenario that I'm talking about here, um, is the breakthrough. And we need to support that. There's more, imp more ammunition, more longer range weapons, uh, more air defense, uh, more drones, long range drones, that that we need to provide them. That could happen in two months. That could happen this summer. There's a longer scenario, a less optimistic scenario, um, where both sides are tired. Both, neither side can break through. And that's the, that's the scenario where it drags on. I mean, that's what we've been seeing for the past couple of months. And that, this past couple of months, drags on. Neither, a lot of fighting. More people kill, uh, but not a decisive outcome, not, not a win on, on either side. Now, I don't know how that one ends up. Um, there, are some, there are some models we can think of. We can think of kind of North Korea, South Korea, where, where there wasn't a, a, a truce, a treaty, there wasn't, there wasn't an agreement at the end, um, and the South Koreans went on and built up their country. Um, um, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility in that longer scenario. So in, the, in those two scenarios, there are different implications for us. There are different implications for the West, 
but people in Canada, people in the United States, people in, in Europe. If the Ukrainians win, then Ukraine will be firm, established, um, maintained. Uh, it will be established as a democracy, a strong democracy, um, that would be would would benefit the EU from joining uh, if they joined. It would benefit NATO um, if Ukraine, in this short scenario where they have defeated the Russians, NATO would be proud. Um, NATO would benefit um, with Ukraine. It would, in that scenario, Ukraine will be the strongest army on the continent. Um, strongest army on the continent. And, and NATO um, would be strengthened by having um, Ukraine in it. That's, that's one of the implications for this short scenario. Another, this, the one question we can think about here, um, accountability. Accountability. Um, uh, if Ukraine wins in the way that I just described, um, then the accountability, the, the holding responsible the Russians um, all the way to the top who are guilty of war crimes, are guilty of genocide, um, are guilty of atrocities. They're guilty, President Putin is guilty <coughs> of the fundamental crime, the original crime, which is the crime of aggression. And there's no, right now, there is no court, there's no forum, there's no tribunal that can hold Putin responsible for that fundamental crime. Crime of aggression is the original crime. Then there is, uh, there are atrocities, then there are genocide, um, then there are war crimes, uh, but it comes, it all stems from the crime, the original decision, the crime uh, that Putin took, the decision that he took, that's the crime of aggression, and somehow we have to hold him responsible. Ukraine needs to win in order to do that. The UN actually needs to establish a tribunal an international tribunal with the Ukrainians to be able to hold Putin accountable for that crime. That's, that's important to do. Otherwise, we don't have a way to go after him. That's important. Another question for people in this room, all of us, as we're thinking about Ukraine's future, how, how does it recover the democratic practices, some of which have had to be constrained during the war? There are constraints on political parties. There are constraints on press. There is a major, one principal marathon news channel. Um, and all of those democratic principles and practices need to be kind of reestablished, relaxed. Right now it's martial law. Perfectly understandable. We understand about martial law. We remember in World War, our World War II. Um, some constraints uh, on our democratic practices. Um, this is not unusual, but after the victory, after the war is over, after the victory, then the Ukrainians will have to think about going back to that. How do they reestablish, reaffirm their commitment to, to those democratic principles, to make them strong, to make them members of the EU. There are many of those kinds of steps that, that have to happen. I'm, I'm going to just end my remarks, and then I'd love to get your thoughts, um, with just a couple of, a couple of reminders. Uh, probably don't need to make them, but I'll let me just say them. Why it's so important that Ukraine win this war. <clears throat> They're fighting for themselves. The Ukrainians are fighting for their existence. It's existential for the Ukrainians. Um, they're fighting, they know, they're soldiers. Again, people in this room, all, we all know soldiers who are fighting um, on the front lines. They know why they're fighting. They're fighting for their families. They're fighting for, they're fighting for their communities. They're fighting for their nation. They understand what, what's at stake for them. The Russians don't. The Russians the Russian soldiers, one of the reasons that they are spent, that they've done so poorly, is they don't know why they're fighting. They've not, Putin's not been able to describe this. It's important, though, beyond Ukraine. It's important that Ukraine win, not just because it's existential for the Ukrainians, but it's also in the, it's, it, it will determine European security. European security um, will be challenged will be threatened, European security will be threatened if the Russians are, are on the border of Poland. 
uh, on the on the border of, uh, of Slovakia. Um, this this is a t and our our allies, our NATO allies, um, will be threatened by a victorious Russia should they win. That's why it's so important that the Ukrainians win. Um, that will that will threaten us. That will threaten the United States. And in a broader sense as well, um, we would like to think um, that there are some principles, and, and actually, Lisa, you quoted them. I let, thank you for doing that. I'd forgotten that I'd. Um, there are some principles that are important to us that kept the peace um, in a major way. Um, it kept us out of World War III for all those years between 1945 and 2014 when the Russians invaded. Um, and those principles in the UN Charter that we all signed, and the Soviets signed up for, we signed up for, uh, respect for sovereignty, respect for the borders of your neighbors. That kept, that kept us out of a major war. There were smaller wars, uh, there were smaller conflicts, I uh, fought in one, um, the, but, but it kept that base, those basic rules um, need to be reestablished. And if they are reestablished, then we are better off. We are a lot better off if big nations can't invade smaller nations and change the borders, grab up their territory, um, and get away with it. That's, that's not a world we want to live in. Our children, our grandchildren, um, it's a better war, it's a better world um, if the Ukrainians win and reestablish those, those principles. The last thing that, uh, why it's important for me, um, and I think I speak for a lot of people, Canadians, Americans, and a lot of people around the world, about why this is such a horrible war, it's because of what I've already mentioned in terms of the atrocities. Um, several of us have been, probably a lot of us in this room, um, have, have been to, to Kiev, have been to Ukraine over the past 12 months, now 14 months. Um, and 25 minutes, 20 minutes out of Kiev is Bucha. Um, and right next to it is Irpin. And just up around it is uh, Hostomel, and Kharkiv, and Kherson, uh, and Liman, um, Izum. These towns have seen the most horrible events, uh, the most horrible atrocities, the most horrible crimes um, that the Russians have inflicted on, on anybody, on people, on Ukrainians. Um, another reason why Ukraine is not ready, not willing, not going to negotiate to give back part of their country. Why? Whenever the Russians have occupied part of Ukraine, they have killed Ukrainians, civilians. Not just killed, tortured. Ukrainian people don't want to give up any of the of, of Ukrainians to that kind of that kind of treatment. It's that moral outrage. It's that horror um, that we find horrible um, and 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 unacceptable. Again, this is why Ukraine has to win. So um, that's why I think it's important. Um, winning means getting the Russians, kicking the Russians, pushing the Russians out of Ukraine. That can happen in the next two months. We get a say. We, it's up to us to be able to provide uh, the Ukrainians with, with what they need. And so it's up to everybody in this room, but it's broader. We have to maintain that support. Um, and and that's, what, uh, that's what I'm here to talk to you about here today. And I'd love to get your thoughts, love to get your comments. Take your, your questions however we can do this. Lisa, do this. Thank you. Um, I think we all agree that Ukraine needs to win. I think we all agree that Ukraine needs to win. And uh, we all know how much, how immense the aid has been from the United States. It's like head and shoulders above any other country, if you look at the graphs. Um, I'm just wondering, I have heard and I have read the Czech president speak about the fact that if Ukraine doesn't win in this counteroffensive that the support from the rest of the world is going to very likely dwindle, that they really have to get it right this time. And it was really kind of a scary thought, um, especially considering the damage that was caused by the leaked documents 
and similar things that could happen that could impact very negatively on the counteroffensive. So I'm just wondering how what you th how your comments about aid uh, sort of coexist with the comments about that Ukraine has to get it right this one time. So it's probably right. I mean, the, pre the president, the new Czech president, is probably right. That is um, the best opportunity um, is this one. Uh, is this summer, for the reasons I said. You know, the, the Russians are at their weakest point, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, the Ukrainians have been getting support from us, uh, not just Americans, but, but from NATO, um, and, and are, in, are in very good shape. Um, we don't know if they're in good enough shape, and that's the question. Um, because um, it will be hard, it'll be, it'll be very hard um, to break through. Um, and it will, it's going to be bloody, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be very painful. Um, and, in, and if it fails, he's right, the president's right, um, then it will be, it'll take some time, uh, again, to mount it, to, 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 refit, to refit, uh, to start over. Um, so it is important to do this. And um, if it does succeed, if they're able to succeed, that will increase the support. That will increase the likelihood that we won't get tired, that we won't start to fade on this, that we will continue to provide. And we've done that, and that will allow them to, to make that success. It's the, it's the right question about the continued support. I mean, that's my whole point, is that we need to continue that support. It's going to be hard, and it is already hard. And we're already seeing, you know, do the polls. Well, I've read the same, same polls. You know, it goes down a little bit. But it's still in the United States, and I suspect it's true here, um, that the broad majority of Canadians and Americans and Europeans continue to support Ukraine in its fight. Um, and yes, it may, maybe it's not 78%, maybe it's 72%. Uh, um, it, and in our Congress, um, maybe it's not every one of the, of the Republicans, but it's nearly all. It, it's a lot. It's, it's the majority of the Republicans in, in Washington. Um, and, and, it's, and it's all of the serious Republicans in, in Washington, in, in my view. Um, um, and, and I, but I think it's, it is important uh, that they win now for, for all that. The other reason is the Russians, as I say, there's a lot of Russians. Um, and they can build back up. Um, so now, now is the time. I think now is the time. Sir. Mr. Ambassador, uh, your sincerity and long-term support of Ukraine. Sorry. Mr. Ambassador, your, your sincerity and your long-term support of Ukraine is, is extremely commendable. But one aspect of your remarks today troubled me very much, and I'd like your, your comments on this, because I, although you, you mentioned the possibility that they would stop at Crimea. And to me, this raises the, the, the troubling question of can a, you know, what is the impact of that with regard to EU membership, NATO membership? You know, you're then faced with a frozen conflict. Uh, much as I understand the, the difficulties of, of trying to fight a gigantic uh, country like uh, Russia with nuclear and armed with nuclear weapons, etc., I'm, I'm, not, I'm not naive in that regard, but I'm very troubled by that aspect of how do you see that situation? So it's a great question. It's a great question. So in, this is in my short scenario, in my this summer breakthrough, exploit the breakthrough, push the Russians out of all, all the way back uh, into Russia, including Donbass, but with the question about Crimea, and that's a, that's a good question about Crimea, and then, uh, and then do they stop, the, do the Ukrainians stop there? Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. Maybe they continue to push, push down. Because if the Russians crumble, as I've suggested they might, it, that might affect their ability to even hold in Crimea. So that could happen. But if it doesn't, Crimea, as everybody in this room knows, is, you know, you got five miles across that little isthmus. Um, so moving military forces into Crimea is hard, is hard. It does, it does it though, it's not that hard. Once that land bridge, once all of Kherson, um, Zaporizhia, um, uh, 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 Donetsk, once that's there, then, the, then Crimea is vulnerable to long-range fires. 
So, that, so the military, the Ukrainian military, could put pressure um, on Crimea that way as well, even if they don't occupy it. Um, and if there's some a discussion about over what period of time Crimea comes back to Ukraine, that could still. Now, your question is good about the EU and NATO in that circumstance. Um, West Germany joined, was, joined the European Union, helped form the European Union while, while the Soviets dominated East Germany. So that, doesn't, that wouldn't keep that part of Ukraine, even if it, didn't, if it didn't have Crimea back yet, it wouldn't keep them from joining the EU. And West Germany also joined NATO. Um, and so uh, that would be difficult. If there's, an on, if there's a conflict, if there's an ongoing conflict, then I think Ukrainians um, will wait uh, to apply to NATO. Um, but, uh, but there is no prohibition on, joining, on applying to join NATO uh, just because you, have, you don't control part of your territory. Um, and again, the, the, the proposal is, the suggestion is, uh, the possibility is that Crimea comes back over time. Um, that it, it's not part of this military taking back, it's part of the diplomatic taking back. Does that answer your question, you think? Uh, yes, it's not It is, I, I, I confess. It, we, I do too. Uh, I do too. Sir. Thank you, Ambassador, for your comments and your insight. Uh, one thing that has troubled many of us uh, since the very beginning of the conflict is the incremental, slow military support, particularly from the US. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet with a number of American analysts um, that were visiting, and they wanted to meet with some community members back in April of last year. And they asked me, where do you think this is going? Well, clearly, Ukraine is not just gonna give up. Well, we see that, but how did, do you think at that point, US had given about $5 billion in military aid? And I compared that to the aid they gave the Soviets uh, under the Lend-Lease program, which was in today's dollars over $100 billion, 4,000 planes, thousands of tanks. So the, the aid came, but it seems to come in small pieces. We know that uh, HIMARS were asked for from the beginning. It took, what, six months or four months for them to show up. Heavy tanks were not in the picture. Well, now we know they're there. Um, and y Ukraine now is desperately asking for it. F-16s, all right, that may take a little bit longer to, to train on, but longer range missiles shouldn't be a, pro a problem. They can go into the HIMARS now and be sent up to 300 kilometers. Well, in your opinion, why do you think, particularly the US, because they're the, the biggest and, and the most of it, why is it that the US seems to be giving these this kind of support in drips and drabs rather than making it a decisive win for Ukraine with what they need right now. Right, there's no good reason why not. There's no good reason why not. They, they absolutely should. Uh, we should, the Americans should, NATO should, the Brits should, they've got some long range weapons as well. I do believe, uh, you're right that the F-16s, the, those, those uh, fighter aircraft are not for this counteroffensive. What I'm really focused on is this, well we should, I think we agree, we should focus on this counteroffensive and um, the long range, the one thing that we could easily do um, is these ATACMs, these longer, these like 300 kilometer uh, range uh, that go on HIMARS, you're exactly right, they're fired from the HIMARS. They should, there's no reason to go, that, there, that there's any hesitation, a policy hesitation to do this um, uh, based on a new, a new preparation. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, drones, the other thing that, that could happen, these long range drones uh, could happen, and those, both of those systems could come, could, could, could come soon, could come now, and should, in my view. I don't, there's not a good reason for them not to come. Now, Roman has mentioned, I don't know if he'll mention again tonight or not, but he, he's pointed out um, earlier today that the Ukrainians actually have some pretty good capabilities themselves, these long range, we remember it took out the Moskva um, uh, themselves. The, the, the Neptunes were Ukrainians, they weren't Western uh, weapons. They may well have some of these kinds uh, of long range fires 
um, uh, to support this, uh, this counteroffensive. But I agree with you. Um, we should do it right away. But why do you think the administration, uh, I go back to why? There's, 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 no, there's no good reason. You know, we, know, um, we know there were some people that, there are some people right now um, who, and maybe even within the administration, um, who don't want the Ukrainians to use Western weapons or American weapons um, to shoot into Russia. I think that's a mistake. My own view that I think that's a mistake. If if there's a if there's a Russian military unit um, in Russia firing into Ukraine, Ukrainians ought to be able to fire back. I mean that's that's not so hard. <laughs> that's not so hard. So 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 I, so and, and I think those are policy decisions. But the, you know you're right. To ask the question. How, how come they? How, you know. Just one final question. Sure. Please. Do you think that there may be, because I got the sense when I was talking to the analysts, uh, they were talking about their hawks and doves. And, and, and these gentlemen that I met from the U.S. and from Washington, they said, we're, we're, we agree with you. But there are other people within the administration that um, are, are maybe, don't, don't see it the same way. And are concerned, uh, you know, the, the the long range missiles. I think that could be easily resolved. You just get Ukraine to guarantee. Okay, so we won't shoot. Yep, and uh, the Ukraine we'll shoot into Crimea, but we won't shoot into. And the no, Ukrainians have given know. those assurances and have lived up to them. And they've done, absolutely. They've done it with the HIMARS. Too. Yeah, and you're right. There are debates. Um, there are debates within the administration, within any administration. I imagine there's even debates within the Canadian administration that uh, on policy decisions. Um, and I know that there are those people in the administration arguing the same thing you and I are agreeing on. That is HIMARS. Um, that is the long-range drones. Um, uh, that is uh, more of the air defense. Uh, finally, you, you mentioned the tanks and the, you know, there, there's coming, there's coming, but it's, it needs to be now. I, I fully agree. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, Ted. Oh, thank nope. you, Ambassador. Uh, we talked about it earlier today, but I thought it'd be worth uh, bringing up is the $350 billion that are held in assets yep. uh, around the world. Because, um, look, if, if we can get Vladimir Putin to finance his own defeat, um, we should be doing that because there's a lot of money there that can buy weapons and alleviate donor fatigue, but also be applied towards reconstruction later on. You're absolutely right. Um, um we did talk about this earlier, but I think it's, it, it merits uh, discussing again. Um, um, President Biden called President Putin a couple times, actually, but um, the, just before, so in like December of 2021, so what, three months, two months before the invasion, the big invasion, he, and President Biden called President Putin and said, don't do this. Uh, at this point, we all remember um, the intelligence was very good. Not everyone believed it, um, but the, the intelligence was very good. And we were very explicit that they're, they intend, in all likelihood, um, to invade. And so President Biden called President Putin and said, don't do it. And if you do, there will be, there will be consequences. We're going to build up the eastern flank of NATO. We're going to provide Ukraine with weapons. Um, and we're going to put serious sanctions on you. And I am sure... This is not in the public, but I am <clears throat> sure that in the private conversation between Biden and Putin, he, he said exactly what kind of sanctions he was going to put on. Not just SWIFT, um, but other sanctions as well. Um, uh, and, and President Putin said, I can wait you out. I, I've got this $600 billion cushion, foreign currency reserves, in the, in the Russian central bank. Uh, 600 billion in the Russian Central Bank of Reserves that I can I can get through those sanctions. 300 billion dollars of that 600, so half, probably a little more than half, G7 banks. They're not in Russian banks. It's not in Moscow. They're in G7 capital. G7 banks. 300 billion dollars, and they're frozen. Those funds are frozen. Um, and what needs to happen? And what it again within the administration in Washington? There's a debate. There's a debate going on right now, how to seize those frozen funds and put them into a international fund for reconstruction or the ongoing fight um, uh, in terms of the military. Um, seize those funds. 
I understand Canada has passed the right legislation, the legislation enabling the Ukrainian banks um, to move that, uh, Ukrainian, the Canadian government to move the uh, funds from Canadian banks into a fund, international fund. We're not there yet. We need, the Americans need to be there. And other G7 as well need to do that. But you're right. You're right. It's just, it's inconceivable that we would ask Canadian taxpayers, American taxpayers, European taxpayers to fund reconstruction or continue to provide the funds just to keep the Ukrainian government going when we've got $300 billion of Russian money. Um, this, it doesn't, the, the other thing is, this is not personal money. So there are probably, there are probably a lawyer or two in this room. And lawyers, um, are, are, you know, one of the things they do is, is defend private property and property rights. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here, this is in the central bank. This is Russian central bank. Doesn't belong to any oligarch, doesn't belong to any person. Um, it belongs to the regime that is responsible for invading its neighbor. And it, it ought to pay reparations and that $300 billion ought to go. Thank you for asking that question, Ted. Oh, Sir. Yeah, okay. Sir. If I may. Yep. Where are we here? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you for being so supportive of Ukraine in your work. Uh, you're a, a leading light in, in terms of the debate and in, in your efforts. Um, I want you to hear a different view in terms of Crimea and this business of, well, let's go this far and then we'll debate Crimea. Good, good. Uh, and I'd like to draw the analogy uh, with World War II. It, an analogy that might be drawn is, okay, Hitler, if you get out of Czechoslovakia, then we can uh, reach some sort of a peace. We're in a situation here. Why are we Canadians, Americans fighting or helping in this war? Isn't it all about borders? Isn't that what this fight is about? And isn't the threat to the international rule of law the basic reason why we're into this thing? How can we defend our principles by uh, compromising on the very thing that brought us into this fight, this business of, war, of boundaries. As a lawyer, I know that one of the biggest uh, fights that you can have between parties is over boundaries. Uh, you know, God forbid someone bring in a client into my office where he's in a fight with a boundary with another neighbor. It's just the worst kind of fight you can have. And on an international level, I believe the same thing is true. Boundaries, I mean, that's, wasn't that what Helsinki was all about? Wasn't that why we fought in World War II and so on? So I don't get this business about, well, you know, we'll talk about Crimea and so on. This is a fight for Ukraine. Hit, uh, Hitler was a menace to the free world uh, in World War II. Putin is a menace to us not just because he's going to get out of Ukraine, but he's a menace to us in Russia. And indeed, uh, I know this is sort of not the kind of discussion you may want to hear about, but we think, or a lot, uh, many people believe that uh, Putin is the problem and Russia is the problem. And stopping at the border of Ukraine is only half a measure as to what may be necessary to live in a free or a better world for ourselves and our children. So but at the very least, I believe the, uh, the line that Ukraine itself has defined being a free Ukraine is where we've got to go. In the war. I, I agree with that. I agree. I, the, and the Ukrainians have to decide that. And that's why I quoted the foreign minister and the president, uh, Kuleba and, uh, and Zelensky. Because um, it's, it's that, that, it's up to them. You're absolutely right. You're also right that the principle of territorial integrity, of sovereignty, um, uh, is one of the reasons uh, we, are, we are in this, that we're supporting the Ukrainians. Um, and um, the Ukrainians have said, and Zelensky and Kaleva have both said, as, and when they're having this conversation about uh, Crimea, uh, about taking back most of the land, of the territory, uh, militarily, uh, but being willing to talk about and get some of it back um, diplomatically, that's, that's, that's what they said. And you're right. It's up to them to make that decision. It's not up to us to make that decision. The, as, you, as we all know, there are some people um, who go further and say, uh, well, we, the Americans or the West or the Europeans, ought to lean on the, on the Ukrainians to stop now. 
you know, just stop now. So, you know, yeah, give up a little bit of territory, but at least get, stop the fighting, um, stop the killing. Um, my government's not there. Your government's not there. No government is, at, is there at this point. Um, I hope they don't get there. This is a decision that the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians are fighting for every square meter. They have said they're going to take back most of that militarily, some diplomatically. That's, that's up to them. Now, if, if one of the implications of what you were saying was Putin is the problem, yes, Putin's the problem. However, that's not part of our goals. Uh, that's up, in my view, that's up to the Russians to figure out how to deal with that problem. Um, there are those um, on the other end of the spectrum who would say, yep, Putin is the problem and we should do everything we can to get rid of that problem. Um, that goes too far. Uh, as far you know, that's, we don't do that well. Um, uh, and and I, don't think, I don't think that's where we will, we will get to on that. Good, but I'm glad you raised that question. Sir. I, I want to talk about another facet of this conflict, and that is where is the natural power of the two structures that are back? On the one hand, we have the democracies of the world who firmly believe that they are right, and on the other hand, we have a collection of autocracies who also believe that their organizational structure is going to prevail. Now, the question I have is, given the fact that Russia has already been somewhat successful in influencing American, influencing not just elections in the United States, but elections in many, many democratic countries, and are still trying to do that, and I recall the days, the Soviet days, when we had a completely different communications network. And there were kind of like Radio Liberty, Radio Free, Free World. And that had an enormous influence on the thinking of the Soviet citizens. My question is, should we be putting some energy in trying to influence the cognitive societal cognitive bias of the autocracies, because certainly Russia is doing its best to influence the uh, cognitive bias of the Western world. We should, I, I, I think we should. However, um, we will have an effect. Um, the, the best way to have that effect, which, uh, which you rightly point out, is, would be good to be able to, for democracies or um, uh, nations that uh, listen to their people, if to, for them to succeed um, will be the way that, that to influence those people living in autocracies or even the leaders of autocracies. And what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we need to act um, and we need to win Ukraine needs to win in that battle between that democracy and that autocracy and, and our support for that democracy. Yes, somewhat because it's democracy, but also because it's, uh, it's, it's this whole thing about sovereignty that we were talking about earlier and territorial integrity. Um, and those principles, those, those principles apply across all. We want you know, China is an autocracy, um, and China might be able to lean on the Russians. If anyone can lead on Putin, it's going to be President Xi. Um, um, and if they, see, if the Chinese see that the that NATO and the West are able to support successfully Ukraine, such that Ukraine can win when attacked by that by the Russians, that will deter Chinese. Uh, my own view is that will reduce the chances of a, of a Chinese attack on Taiwan, but it will also uh, reduce the, the, uh, the thinking, the cognitive perception that you described um, around the world about autocracies that they cannot invade their neighbors and succeed. Um, I, that is, I think we have to act. Um, I think you're right, we have to tell our story, but our story has to be a strong 
a, a, a story of strong support for our democratic allies, um, and that will be the that'll be the deciding one. Sir. Um, as a firm believer, I want to sort of jump ahead and say, okay, um, somewhere along the line, we believe in what we call Peramoha. In other words, we get to the point where the Russians are out of Ukraine. Okay. We now are faced with two scenarios. The first one, the one that I'd really like to see, but the Americans are scared of, Russia falls apart. Uh, I'm not going to talk about why they're afraid of it. I, 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 I dispute that. Uh, I, okay. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think Americans are afraid of it. I think that if it happens, it happens. Okay. Uh, that's okay. We, you know, some. That, I'm just on this point. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. B because somebody, people in this room will remember <clears throat> a, an earlier president, um, George H. W. Bush, who went to Kiev um, in 1991 um, and. Told the Ukrainians, stay calm, don't rock the boat. Chicken Kiev, this is a Chicken Kiev speech. Yeah, no new Chicken Kiev speeches. You know, we're, we're, you know, it, it turned out, it turned out um, that the Ukrainians didn't listen to him and voted and, and dissolved the Soviet Union you know, months after that, um, and the sky didn't fall. Um, and so it's not, you know, there are going to be some problems associated with the breakup of the Russian Federation, but you know, we, we could probably handle it. So we're not afraid of it. But that's not the question. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, I, but I'm glad you had that opportunity. The, the other alternative is that we push them out. Uh, Russia changes, whatever. I'm not going to get into how, whatever. It's still there. And like some people like to say, all wars end in negotiations, and those people don't know history. But that's okay. So we now sit down and we negotiate. Question. What makes Budapest two any different than Budapest one? Yeah, so there, there should not be. Absolutely right, absolutely right. Um, but you bring up the right question. What is the security guarantee for Ukraine in either of the scenarios I just described, and either of the ones that you just described? That is, um, Ukraine is not going to accept a Budapest two. Um, um, you know, so that's that's not on the table. How are Ukrainians going to assure their security? How are we going to assure their security? And it seems to me there are two reasons, there are two ways, two methods. One is to admit Ukraine to NATO. If Ukraine's in NATO, they are secure. Um, they are secure. That, full stop. Um, another way, maybe while well, that process plays out, that is the NATO accession process plays out, is to make Ukraine strong enough itself to deter and defend itself from another Russian attack, which is what Budapest I was supposed to do. It didn't. Um, and what does that mean? We have a long-term agreement, memorandum, not a treaty with the Israelis, but a long-term agreement with the Israelis that says we will provide you over time um, a lot of money to buy top-of-the-line weapons um, that will enable you, the Israelis, to defend, to, to deter an attack on you and defend yourself uh, with these, these. It's not a it's not a bilateral defense agreement. We we don't promise to come to the aid to send my old unit the. 101st Airborne to, to Israel if they're attacked, no. Um, we are providing, that we are making them so strong that no, no none of their enemies will, will attack them. That's what we should do for Ukraine. The Americans and the Canadians and the Europeans uh, may not be all NATO members, but we ought to make that commitment to Ukraine in either of the two scenarios that I described, either when the Russians are kicked out, they're still gonna need a uh, security guarantee. Um, or if there is some kind of a, of a stalemate, they're still going to need a, stale, uh, a security guarantee in, in, that, in that scenario. So those are the two ways. Sir. Ambassador Ross, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very thoughtful remarks. Um, 
this afternoon in uh, RCMI and here you you touched the issue of uh, the basic principles which should be recomm uh, recommitted yes, and basic rules which should be re-established like you said it well uh, here. Uh, so those basic principles, you know, they are enshrined in UN Charter, you know, yes, and, and uh, as well as in OSCE Charter, yeah, which, which is a result of, of the Helsinki Final Act of 1975. And in both cases we have, we have, um, we, we are dealing with the, with the UN member and, and UN Security Council permanent member and active part active member of the of the conference on on security you know and and cooperation in europe so um i just would like to to to, to hear from you more in depth of whether there are any kind of exchange of thoughts you know in atlantic council among your you know colleagues experts about that how do you see that the the, the process of recommitment by the post-war russia let's say let's let's put it in this way yeah, and uh, the second, the, the another part of that, um, the the question is uh, the I would say legality of of uh, the presence of the Russian Federations among the permanent members of the UN Security Council because now we have we have evidences we can, we have documents when the former. President Yeltsin, he submitted a letter on behalf of the CIS countries, you know, uh, that they, uh, well, delegated the Russia, it's, it's the place of the USSR in the United uh, uh, Nations Security Council at a time when CIS did not exist at all. You know, so so this raises the the, the issues of uh, and uh, whether we have uh, the right to 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 follow this discussion. I mean, among the UN members and 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 two, so on. Two, for the, yes, two thank excellent you. questions. Two excellent questions. One one is how to get this recommitment um, by the international community, um, including the Russians after the defeat, after their defeat, after the victory. Uh, the Ukrainian victory. How? What's the? How does that recommitment happen? And it is to principles, sovereignty, territorial integrity, peaceful resolution of disputes in the UN Charter. Exactly what you say. I think the answer has to be Ukraine has to win. The, the Russians definitely have to be. It has to be demonstrated that the violation of those principles cannot stand. Um, and and the international community um, will act, act, not just talk about it, but act um, to to ensure that those principles are upheld. That, that will be a recommitment. Your question about um, getting the Russians off the Security Council or out of the UN, it's a great question. And, and, and uh, the Ukrainians in New York, or probably in Kiev, but uh, in New York, have explored exactly the, along the lines that you had just described. That is, um, it may be that the process by which uh, uh, Russia took the seat uh, from the Soviet, from, you know, the Soviet Union disappeared and the Russians just sat down on that seat. That may have been a violation of process somehow. Um, and there could be a, a way to kick the Russians off. I think it's a great, great, great to pursue. Um, I don't hold my breath uh, on this. I, I, I worry about the UN Security Council. The UN does a lot of good work. There are other parts of the UN that does, you know, you know the World Health Organization and, you know, and, and transportation, regulation of radio frequency. You know, there's a lot of stuff that the UN does well. Uh, but the UN Security Council was demonstrated to be ineffective um, um, at, at this point. And doing what the main, the main purpose of the UN in the late 40s, what, when it was established, was to stop wars. Um, and, and when it, when it, is the instigator of the war, it's, uh, it's useful. I'm not sure how you fix that. Maybe the Ukrainians are right and maybe you can kick them out. Uh, it, it'll, it'll probably take a vote of the... Another question here. Yes, sir. Any, uh, any other questions that have been answered yet? Yeah, okay, please. Another easy question, I'm sure. I have, I have one big fear that, uh, as I'm listening to all of your comments, uh, Mr. Ambassador, 
And that is, we all recognize that America has, is the strongest power, clearly, the helping Ukraine today. The Europeans, unfortunately, you know, they're segmented, et cetera, and they, they don't quite have the armament uh, base that the U.S. has. So the U.S. is the force that is keeping the war. Obviously, the war effort in Ukraine is um, amazing, but without the support of the, and weaponry, it would fail. Uh, any attack that we're talking about would fail without that weaponry. Uh, and the, the question I have for you is, well, what about America's commitment? Um, I, the political turmoil in the U.S. is, is unprecedented in our times. Uh, how unprecedented? Wait, wait, wait. We've had, we've had turmoil. The previous administration was turmoil. I think you know the question. I, 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 I'm I, I know right you're there. I, I know. I, yeah. So uh, this comes up. Of course, this is, this is a concern. Um, but I, I say again um, that the broad spectrum um, of American people um, support Ukraine and, and, and on a bipartisan basis, on a steady basis, um, uh, certainly over the past year, but even a long time before. As, as that strong support. It's been bipartisan support all along. Um, and um, the, some of the strongest supporters are Republicans in the, both the House and the Senate. The, of course, the Republicans control our House of Representatives, but the chairman of, the, of all of the main committees, foreign relations, uh, uh, defense, um, those, those Republican chairs of those committees, strong support for Ukraine. They were in the Munich Security Council. I sat on tables with them, had conversations. With them. So that, and, and on the Senate side, Senator McConnell, you know, has been in Cave. You know, he's, he, he, you know, so they're there. Now, it is true that that won't last forever. And it's, you know, you do the polls and it comes down a bit. Um, but this, this attack, this, this counteroffensive this summer, uh, will boast that I'm, I am absolutely sure. Um, all to say that the, the broad support in my country, in the United States, um, continues so far. I think it will continue at least for another year, um, at least for another year. And, uh, and during that year, Ukraine's going to win. Hello, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I would like to push Where further. Are we here? Uh, a question uh, that uh, Mokovinitsky made, and I, I thought that's where the question was going. Uh, we heard that uh, Russia is a problem for world democracy. We heard Putin is a problem. And my kind of question is, why do we stop at the border? Uh, what kind of yeah. what kind uh, of discussion? I, I thought that's what he was going to get too. Okay. I, 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 I think he was. was. Yeah, I, but I, I would like to articulate it <clears throat> maybe a little bit more clearly. Please. Uh, what kind of discussion is there out there that uh, we do not need uh, Russian Federation to exist? Uh, what is the discussion about the possibility of eliminating Russia? Uh, Patton thought that was a good idea. Uh, it was thought that uh, uh, it was the wrong thing to do when, with, with the Yeltsin situation, funding Russia, and now we continue to have this problem. Everybody says that uh, it's only going to take time before Russia reformulates itself and uh, continues to do what it's been doing uh, for the last century. So what's wrong with the Roman formula uh, that Rome used with Carthago. Uh, Carthago de Lenda est, plow the fields, no more problem. Like, wh what, is, what is the debate uh, in, in that issue? You've asked the same question, and, and that's where I thought you were going uh, with your question. So I, I think not, he was. I think he was. And I tried to answer that. That is, <clears throat> the decision about the future of Russia in the first instance has to be Russians. The Russians have to decide this. I don't think we, let me just speak to the United States. If, if the Canadians are ready to go try to topple the, the Kremlin, you know, okay. Uh, but the, the Americans, you know, we've, we used to do that back, you know, in the last century. We probably don't admit it, um, but you know, we, we've, we've done some things in other countries um, that, uh, that tried to change regimes. Okay, it's a mistake. Uh, we're not. We don't do that. We don't do that well. We don't do that. You know, 
it's, it's not effective. Um, there's no political support for it. In, in, so the answer to your question, where's the debate? It's in academic circles. I mean, I have heard this debate. I've heard people say this. I have heard nothing about this um, in my government, but either when I was in it or when I've been advising it. Um, there is no discussion of that. Now, what there is discussion of is how to live with a, with a Russia that hasn't given up empire. How to live with an imperial, an imperialistic Russia. Um, empires fade, empires die. Empires uh, uh, are you know, either one way or the other. Um, and, and we've seen this, we, you know, some empires go gracefully, peacefully. Um, some go uh, uh, militarily, you know, uh, violently. Um, but, you know, the Brits have figured out how to get, you know, they're, they're no longer, they don't have their empire. The French, the Portuguese, um, the Turks, uh, you know, empires, and that's what has to happen to Russia. Russia has to give up the notion that it's an imperial power, that it can control, dominate its neighbors, or, or even beyond. It has to give up, and until then, then there is this debate, until, they, until the Russians are no longer imperialistic, uh, uh, violently expanding, um, until that time, um, how do we deal with the Russians? And you know, we've got some experience with the Soviet Union. Where there's a, we, we talked about containment uh, and deterrence. Um, and that, in answer to your question, that conversation is going on. That, there's not a conversation that I'm aware of uh, of going beyond the, the borders into the Kremlin. You wanna come back on that? Is that, uh, okay, all right, all right. But there's no policy in Washington that would counter the Russian Empire disintegrates. If the if the Russian Empire disintegrates, you know that's that doesn't scare us. Someone thought that this might scare us. No, it doesn't scare us. I mean that, that's that's a problem to deal with. It's, you know we want to be sure that the nuclear weapons um, are secured, right? We want to be sure that there's not a humanitarian disaster. I was part of of the U.S. government um, in 1991, late 1991, early 1992. Uh, when when we were worried that there was going to be there, there were going to be bread riots in all fifteen or twelve uh, former Soviet states, you know, we thought that there was going to be chaos. Um, turned out it wasn't. We we mounted a big airlift. We sent we sent uh, big loaded aircraft, humanitarian jammed aircraft, to all twelve. New independent states. I'm not sure we sent them to uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but the other the other twelve we did um, uh, because we were worried. So you you have to deal with that. You have to be prepared for that. You have to. There was a lot of diplomacy that went into bad diplomacy that get, went into getting some of those uh, weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, back out of Kazakhstan, Belarus, and. Ukraine um, uh, and and the Budapest Memorandum was was part of that. That was a mistake, um, and Bill Clinton just recently said it was a mistake. You probably saw that. Um, but so there's diplomacy to be done. Uh, but no, we're not afraid of it. If it happens, it happens. It's probably pro my view probably a good thing. Bravo. Yeah. Okay, but you have one more question. Oh, here? one more question. Last one. Uh, why not help? Uh, in this process. You, you seem to be putting everything on Ukraine right now. How about calling uh, Russia an empire? How about calling it the evil empire? It's not just Putin. How about stopping this infatuation with everything Russian, with Russian literature, which happens to be imperialistic? Why not just push diplomatically, not only require the Ukraine to hold, what you're really saying is, that this offensive by Ukrainians is the answer to every evil that Russia is doing. No, no what I'm saying is that Ukraine has to win this war now, and and, and um, that uh, that um, that will stop this. At least at this point, the the Russian Empire expansion. Go ahead. Of course, we hope this will happen. But that doesn't mean that Americans, the American press, 
the American think tanks can't help the process diplomatically in the world. First of all, to influence the other, uh, 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 all the other countries that, that are sitting on the fence. What, for example, is there any um, attempt by, or what is the attempt to influence the, uh, countries like India? All these countries that are sitting on the fence. Absolutely, no, you, you bet. There's nothing, there's nothing that comes down to us. I have the, the impression that the Americans are just, okay, they're helping Ukraine, but they don't seem to be doing anything else. I mean, you know, diplomacy is important. It is very important, no, you're absolutely right. And um, the, what we're trying to do, diplomacy is hard though, you're exactly right, and it doesn't get the headlines, and, and part of what we're doing that does our support for the Ukrainians, because the Ukrainians are so heroic and are doing such an amazing job, gets the, gets the attention. But there is an attempt, not just by the Americans, but also by uh, all of our allies as well, to make this case to the Indias of the world, the South Africans of the world, um, to the, and, and, the, and the pitch, the argument, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the way to make that case, I think, is to talk about each nation's sovereignty. Every nation wants to feel, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but my, I think that nations want to feel like they are sovereign, they can make their own decisions, that their territory is identified in the boundaries and that those are respected boundaries, that's sovereignty, and that's the argument it seems to me to make to all the other nations to, to re make them see why Ukraine has to win to reestablish that principle of sovereignty. We can talk about democracy, um, and we believe in it, and we think it works best for us, and there are other nations, Canada, lots of other nations who make democracy work, um, but the real, the real argument for, uh, for the Indians, Indians are democracy, uh, but the real argument for, for all nations is sovereignty, it seems to me. And we and the answer is, we do try to make that case. We do try to make that case over and over. We need your help. Uh, you're, you're right, it can't just be the Ukrainians. We need to do that. Thank you. <laughs>